Hi, I'm Magdalena Besanilla. I'm from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And my lab studies how cells obtain their shape. And today, I'm going to tell you about using the powerful reverse genetics that's afforded to us by the Moss Fiscometrella patents to essentially look at a gene family and be able to dissect what parts of the gene family are responsible for polarized growth versus what parts of the gene family are not. And what I'm showing you in this video is the kind of growth that we're really interested in understanding at the molecular level. These are cells from the Moss Fiscometrella patents that are growing at their tips by delivering flexible cell wall material to the tip, and then turgor pressure pushes them and they grow. We can do a lot uh, with this organism, and um, today, RNA interference is going to really be the star of the show in helping us to understand the function of this gene family that we're going to talk about. So first, let me just back up a little bit and tell you that this kind of growth is dependent on the actin cytoskeleton. So actin is a protein that goes from a monomer to a filament, and there are two major populations in these cells. Um, one is a very dynamic array of actin filaments that are rapidly remodeling underneath the plasma membrane. This is the cortical actin array. And then there's also a tip-focused actin spot. And so we want to understand how these arrays are established. And in part one, I told you that depolymerizers were very, very important for this array and for growth. What about proteins that help to make actin filaments? We want to know, do they play a role and what could they be doing? And so one of family of these proteins are called the formins. They nucleate and elongate actin filaments. And what I'm showing you here is a model of a small actin filament in blue, and then the formin FH2 domain. So this is the formin homology 2 domain in red. And that is sitting on one end of the actin filament. And then it has these arms that are waving off of the FH2 domain. That's called the FH1 domain, or the Foreman Homology 1 domain. And that's characterized by stretches of proline residues. Those stretches of proline residues bind to a small protein called profilin. Profilin is a small actin monomer binding protein that likes to bind to actin. And so what basically happens here is you've got profilin bound to an actin, an actin monomer, and this increases the local concentration of actin monomers at the growing end of the actin filament and allows for actin elongation. And so we're just going to blow up this molecule. You can see that then the actin monomer can be added onto the actin filament. What I'm not showing you here is that then that little red dimer sort of shimmies to the top of the filament, and then this process can be repeated over and over again. So this is how formins help to elongate actin filaments. What about the formins in moss? How many are there? So formins belong to gene families, and they belong to gene families in humans. They also belong to gene families in plants. And so it turns out that the model system Arabidopsis thaliana has 21 formin genes. And they group into two different families. It's really hard to study the function of a family where you have so many gene members, because Oftentimes, functional redundancy makes it difficult to identify a phenotype. So in moss, we also have a formin gene family, and it's slightly smaller. So that helps us a little bit. So here I'm showing you the six members of the class one formins. They are all characterized because they have the red domain, which is the formin homology two domain. So if you basically have an FH2 domain, you are a formin. They also have the green domain, which is the FH1 domain. That's where the prolines are. And then they have variable N-terminals, so N-termini. So they have, for example, some of them have a signal sequence, some of them have a transmembrane domain, and so they're actually predicted to be um, integral uh, membrane proteins. And there's this also very interesting one, which has a, a SEC10 domain on the N-terminus. There's also the class II formins. The class II formins, which are the star of today's talk, I have this FH2 domain, have the green FH1 domain, and then have a domain on the N-terminus called a P10 domain. This is homologous to the P10 protein in mammals, which is really, really important in cancer. It is a uh, lipid and protein phosphatase, um, but the P10 domain on these particular 
proteins don't appear to have the important residues for lipid and uh, protein phosphatase activity. So potentially those could just be important for lipid binding. And hopefully I'll show you that that's the case today. And then in mosses, which are a basal type of land plant, um, there's actually a third type of foramen um, uh, on the bottom there. It is a foramen, it has the FH2 domain, it has a very, very tiny FH1 domain, and it has a different end terminus. Um, we're really not going to talk about this guy because it turns out that this one is not expressed in the tissue that we're interested in studying. But how do you tackle a family of uh, this many genes? How do you do a functional analysis rapidly? And so we turn to RNA interference because this would allow us to um, develop constructs that would express re different regions of the different um, genes, and then we could um, build larger and larger constructs to then um, multiplex it and then allow us to target multiple family members at the same time. In order to understand the phenotype, we need to be very quantitative about it. We need to have a very good analysis. And so what we can do is we can take pictures of our plants, and the pictures that we take are fluorescent images, and those images show us uh, a lot of the flor uh, chlorophyll autofluorescence. And so you get these red plants. We can measure the area of the chlorophyll autofluorescence, and that tells us how big the plant is. But how big the plant is doesn't tell us what shape it is. And so we use these morphological uh, parameters, uh, particularly we are using circularity, um, to be able to distinguish between, for example, a circular, a very abnormal plant, because a plant that's circular would not be normal, but a plant that has lots of elongated projections, like a star, would be more normal. And so these two shapes actually have exactly the same area, but they are different in terms of their morphology. And you can distinguish them because the circular plant has a circularity of 1, but the star has a circularity of 0.2. So you can use this to get a good dynamic range on your morphology analysis. OK, so how do we do this analysis? Well, we work on this organism that can be regenerated from single cells. We can transform those cells with a piece of DNA. That DNA has an RNAi construct. And then we can analyze the phenotype a week later to look at what the plants look like. So these are our control plants. Our control plants are silencing a non-essential reporter gene called Gus. And what you can see is that the plants are nice and large. They're red because you can see the chlorophyll autofluorescence. And you can see lots of polarized extensions. Okay. So that's what a normal plant looks like. And the construct will always be at the top of the slide. So you can see that this is the Gus RNAi construct. And so this is our quantification. So we can um, look at the area, and we normalize all of our experiments to our Gus control. So our Gus control will have an area of 1. And then the circularity is down here. And you can see it has a very low circularity because they're very polarized plants. So now we can begin our analysis. And we basically grouped the formins into the formins that were most similar to each other. So we developed a RNAi construct that had um, the formin 1a, b, and c sequences to it. And then we transformed that it, and we looked at the phenotype. And if you were to just look at those images, you would say, oh my gosh, there's no phenotype. But in fact, there's a very small decrease in area. OK, so they contribute a little bit, potentially, to growth. And then if you look at the next two that are similar to each other, because they each have a transmembrane domain but no signal peptide, then you can see that, again, there's a small decrease in area, but the plants are still very polarized. And then we looked at the other group, which in this case was the very strange gene that had the SEC10 domain on it. But also we included Formin 3. Um, at the time we did these experiments, this always happens. We didn't know it wasn't expressed, so we didn't know we didn't have to include it. But we included it just to be safe. And we can see that this actually has the most dramatic uh, uh, effect on um, total area. And this all makes a lot of sense, because it turns out if you look at the expression of these genes, Formin 1F, which is the one that's being silenced here, is the one that's most highly expressed. So they all contribute to growth and they contribute based on how well expressed they are. OK, so now we, we sort of separated the class 1 formins into their little groups of how similar they are. But now we can sort of concatenate them and start putting them together and see what happens. So here is a construct that silences everything except formin 1f and the formin 3. And you can see that that one is small, but not very, very small. Now we add the formin 1f and the formin 3, and it gets smaller. 
but still the plants are polarized. So this construct actually silences all the class one formants. So what this tells us is that while the class one formants are not important for polarity because these plants are very normal looking, they're just a little bit smaller. So they're smaller in that um, that means that they are important. These formants play a role in growth, but they don't play a role in determining polarity. So that was something that was really cool to find out. Like within three or four weeks of making all the constructs, we could immediately tell class one formins are not essential for cell polarity. Something that in any other system would have taken a much, much longer time. All right, so what about the class two formins? Well, I told you they had that uh, different end terminus. So they had the P10 domain and there's only two of them. So we put both of them because they're very similar to each other on the same construct. And lo and behold, we got an amazing phenotype. So you get rid of all the class two formins and all of a sudden now you have these very small plants composed of spherical cells. These are absolutely essential for cell polarity because this is exactly the same phenotype that we get if we get rid of the actin cytoskeleton, which we know is essential for cell polarity. And so you can look at the analysis here of the area. You can see they're very small compared to the control and look at the circularity. The circularity has gone through the roof, right? So again, it's that signal to noise that gives us to look at the morphology as well as the area, all right? So this is the analysis that we did. And from that, we learned that yes, class two formins in Fiscometrella patents, in the MOS Fiscometrella patents are essential for cell polarity. Well, we had all the pieces of DNA and we thought, why not? Let's string them all together. And so we did. And we had a construct now that silences all the formants. Well, we got very sad looking plants. So these plants, you know, don't live very long. They make three or four cells. The cells are enormous compared to um, normal cells. And in the, in the analysis here, they don't look very different from the class two formins uh, RNAi, but they really are quite dead. Um, and they don't last much longer. So if you look at them at nine or 10 days after transformation, they're pretty much gone from the plate. So that tells us that formins are essential for viability. Um, and that was also in, a very important piece of information. And that this phenotype is not necessarily the same phenotype of, of silencing just the class two formins. So they do have um, different roles, the class one versus the class two. All right, so now we know that the class two formins are critical for cell polarity. And there's two of them. So I think the next question is, are they redundant? Do they need to work together or do they have different roles? So in order to do that, what we ended up doing was to look at a region in the sequence that we could use that would be very specific for each gene. Because we didn't, if you have uh, regions of sequence that are very similar between two genes in the coding sequence, you can actually get silencing of the other member. And so we wanted to ensure that that wasn't happening so we went to the untranslated regions of the genes that are very, very different. And so our construct here, strong promoter, expresses a, a inverted repeat of the GUS control gene and the U, U, untranslated region of formin 2A. And so what does that do? That specifically silences the expression of formin 2A. And so then we can use our RNAi assay and we can ask, well, what do the plants look like when you silence just formin 2A? Well, they look just like the wild type. They look very indistinguishable. So we can essentially do exactly the same thing, now make a construct that silences just formin 2b. And then again, we can look at the RNAi and we see that again, they're very large, very polarized plants. Okay, so it's possible these untranslated regions aren't targeting anything, right? It's possible they're just not working, right? So how do we figure that out? How do we test that? Well, the way to test that is to take the UTR of 2a and the UTR of 2b, put them in the same construct. This should silence both of the genes, and this should look just like silencing the coding sequence if those pieces of UTR actually work. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we saw, right? You silence the UTR of 2a, the UTR of 2b, and then you see these very small unpolarized plants. And again, very small and very unpolarized, okay? So that tells us that these two genes are completely functionally redundant and um, that they are essential for cell polarity. This construct, the UTR construct, actually provides us with the ability to do functional genetics, right? We can start asking what regions of the protein are important 
because we can do a complementation assay. So how does that complementation assay work? Well, we have our construct that specifically silences the endogenous genes using their untranslated regions. And then we can co-transform a construct that lacks any untranslated regions, so just has the coding sequence. And then we can see, will that be able to rescue the phenotype? Okay, so this is our complementation analysis. So this is, again, the control plants are large, the UTR silenced plants are very small and very unpolarized. And then if we co-transform now the full length Foreman 2A coding sequence, we can largely rescue the area and the circularity phenotype. Now we can ask, okay, well, we want to know where this molecule is in the cell. That's what we really want to know, because if we know where it is in the cell, we can really start to understand how it works. So let's add a green fluorescent molecule to this coding sequence, and we can do that using molecular genetic tools, and then we can ask, does it rescue the phenotype? And it does. So we can actually tag this molecule with three tandem GFP molecules. And we had to do that just because it was expressed at low levels. And so we needed to have three GFPs there to get enough signal. And you can see that it restores the area and it restores the polarity phenotype. So now we have this powerful tool because we can look at where this protein is expressed in cells. Now, one of the things that Fiscometrella patents does really, really well is it undergoes homologous recombination. So instead of doing these experiments transiently uh, where you transform in and you look at seven-day-old plants only, we can actually generate a stable line that expresses the protein that we want to see. So it has a coding sequence with a GFP tag on it, and then we can actually express it from its own genomic context, from its own promoter. And so how do we do that? Well, we use homologous recombination, so this is just a very schematic diagram of the three prime end of the Foreman 2A gene. Foreman 2A coding sequence is in yellow, and then the UTR, the three prime UTR, is in blue. And so we can make a DNA construct that has the coding sequence fused to those three tandem GFP molecules, and then beyond that, we put an antibiotic resistance cassette so that we can select for that piece of DNA. And then we allow the organism to do its great job, which it uses homologous recombination, and then in, we uh, select for this altered locus. And we can see now that we, instead of having the wild-type Foreman 2A gene in there, we have a Foreman 2A gene that has three, uh, a piece of DNA that will encode for three tandem GFPs um, in frame. So this will allow us to look at the localization. And um, to make sure that the plant isn't affected in any way, we can do quantitative growth assays. And this plant grows just like the wild-type. So we really know that this plant is behaving very similarly during tip growth. OK, so where does it localize? It localizes to the tip of the cell, which is important because it's required for tip growth. And the other thing that it does, if we wanted to look at how it interacts with actin, it would be very useful to be able to image formin at the same time as we image actin. And so we developed a line that has formin labeled in this case with three M cherries and uh, actin probe, LIFACT, that's labeled with green fluorescent protein. So we can look at that in growing cells. And what you can see is that wherever the red accumulates, then you see sort of a yellow burst. And that yellow burst is because right where the red is, the GFP, uh, the life act is, is binding to polymerized actin, all right? And so this clearly tells us that polymerization, the ability of these formins potentially to polymerize actin are an important aspect of its function. So we wanted to probe that with our complementation assay. But we had to sort of understand how is it that this foreman is specifically localizing to this area of the cell? And so we guessed. We figured that the N-terminus was important for this. And so we made a construct that just expresses the N-terminus fused to GFP, put that into plants, and then look to see what happened when you just express the N-terminus or the P10 domain. And this is what happens. So um, those were the images I showed you before, which is the full-length form in 2A fused to three GFPs. And then the, these images right here are the P10 fused to GFP. So you can see that the P10 domain is sufficient to target the formin molecule to the tip of the cell. So this allows us to now play with the polymerization part of the protein, but targeting, targeting it properly to the right place in the cell. Because if you just started expressing different kinds of formins, you might not be able to uh, target to the right place in the cell. So we use our complementation analysis to 
functionally dissect these genes. So we know actin polymerization is important for growth and that these formin molecules are important. So we wanted to understand what region of the molecule is important, and one of the questions that we wanted to ask is this one. Is polymerization mediated by any FH1, FH2 domain sufficient for function? So it's been known for a very long time that the FH1, FH2 domains, as I showed you in that earlier uh, diagram, the FH2 domain sits on the barbed end of the actin filament. The FH1 domain helps with perfilin to add more actin monomers. So these are the, 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 the polymerization engine. And so does it have to be a class two polymerization engine? Or could it be a different polymerization engine? Would it still work if we targeted it to the right place? So we generated chimeric molecules to essentially test this question. And so this is one of the chimeric molecules we uh, made, which had, again, the P10 domain to localize the protein to the right place. But then we took uh, the FH1, FH2 domain from a class 1 formin in uh, Fiscomitrella patents. And we just chose formin 1D. It's expressed well in tip growing cells. And we used its FH1, FH2. But then we wanted to ask, a more complicated question, well, what if we sort of use different combinations of FH1 and FH2 domains? And so we um, generated super chimeric molecules where we had the P10 domain, then the class 2 FH1 and the class 1 FH2, and then the converse. And then we used our complementation assay to ask, do any of these work? Can we restore polarized growth? Um, and how well will they restore polarized growth? So, I, this is the same layout as the previous slides, so the construct is at the top, and as you can see, this is the phenotype that would result from silencing the class 2 formins. So if you put in formin 2, um, you can see that it restores area and restores uh, polarity. But if you put in um, the class 1, FH1, FH2, um, very small plants, pretty much the same size as the um, uh, RNAi alone, and again, very high circularity. There are some tiny little polarized extensions that try to emerge on some of the plants, but mostly it's very unpolarized. So that tells us that class 1 FH1, FH2 doesn't work. Well, can we dissect it a little bit more? Is there a part that is more important than the other? And so here we have the FH2 domain from the class 2, and it's super unpolarized. All right, so it's even worse than using the class 1 FH1, FH2. And this one is also pretty unpolarized. So really what this tells us is that the FH1 and FH2, they have to work together in order for the function of the molecule to be um, intact and to be able to rescue the polarity. Well, we wanted to understand at sort of the biochemistry level, are these all generating actin filaments at the same rate? Do they all function? And so we collaborated with Laurent Blanchot and we, uh, purified the proteins, the FH1, FH2 domains of all of these molecules, and we measured the ability to elongate actin filaments in in vitro um, assays. And we used single molecule total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy assays to do this. And what I'm just going to show you is the, the ultimate result of that. Um, and so this is a graph showing you the rate of actin elongation um, and uh, for all of our molecules. So actin alone is in blue. And formin 2A, FH1, FH2, so that was the one that fully rescued, is a very rapid actin elongator. But all of the other molecules, so the formin 1D, FH1, FH2 in yellow, the chimeras in purple and in green, they really don't make very rapid actin filaments. So what this told us is that, yes, you need an actin elongator, and you need an actin elongator that's very, very rapid, okay? So we then wanted to look at the other end of the molecule. What about the P10 domain? So this P10 domain, I told you, is very similar to a mammalian um, lipid and protein phosphatase. Um, uh, and we don't think it's a phosphatase because it doesn't have the right catalytic residues. And so what, 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 what is it doing? So we did some in vitro assays, and we took the P10 domain, we purified it, and we found that it specifically binds to a phosphonositide. It specifically binds to PI35P2. And it helps to localize the form into the cell cortex. So this particular uh, movie that I'm going to play here 
is a movie taken with total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy, where we can sort of get a, a very uh, detailed view of the cell cortex. And what you can see is that this foramen molecule very, very beautifully localizes to the cell cortex in these spots, and they're very dynamic. And we know that this localization is mediated by that P10 domain as well. And this P10 domain binds this phos very specific phosphonosotide. So we basically wanted to ask the question, OK, if we replace the P10 domain, again, make Frankenstein molecules, and replace it with something that binds P a different phosphonosotide, could we rescue function? How important is that PI35P2 to its function? So we made a molecule that would bind to PI34P2. And that molecule could not localize to those cortical dots, and it could not rescue the function. Then we made a molecule that could bind PI45P2. It also could not rescue and could not um, localize to cortical dots. Then we took a yeast protein that binds PI35P2. We put it on the N-terminus of the FH1, FH2, and it rescued, and it localized to cortical dots. We thought, OK, so that's probably a mistake. Let's try a different protein. So we took a mouse protein that also binds specifically to PI35P2. We put it on the N-terminus, and it also rescued. And it rescued very, very well. And so this tells us that PI35P2 binding is very important for the function. So now we've dissected this, fun this molecule down. We know that it has to bind PI35P2 in order for it to work. And we also know that it has to rapidly elongate actin filaments. So we wanted to look at its activity at the cell cortex in vivo. Okay? So this required us to lose this total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy to do this imaging. So this is a similar movie. It's actually the same movie that I showed you earlier when it was really blown up. But what we did was look at the behavior of these cortical dots. And so we basically put them into little groups. So we have some that are relatively stationary, some that move relatively random, but then some that move in linear trajectories. And those linear trajectories are really obvious. If you take this movie and you take three seconds of time and you just make a maximum projection of, that time, of those three seconds. And that's shown here. So you can see in this um, still now that's basically adding up all of the, the time points, you can see very nicely linear trajectories that are made by this molecule. Now remember, these molecules very rapidly act, uh, elongate actin filaments. So you can envision that this molecule is sitting on the end of an actin filament generating a linear molecule. If that's the case, then those trajectories should disappear if we get rid of the actin filaments. And so we treated with latrunculin, which is a drug that depolymerizes actin filaments. And lo and behold, you get a bunch more stationary, some random, and absolutely no linear trajectories, as shown here when we do that maximum projection. So yes, what we're seeing when these molecules move in linear trajectories is most likely the generation of an actin filament. That's really cool to actually be able to see that in a living cell. So we wanted to see if we could do that with two colors. And so these things are very, very rapid. We had to actually use um, special um, imaging so that we could actually acquire both of the colors at the same time um, so that there was no time delay. And so uh, we, again, imaged actin with LifeAct, this molecule that binds to filamentous actin. And this is a movie showing Foreman in purple, Life Act in blue. And I made a little circle to show you where, and this is looping continuously, where a Foreman molecule appears on the cell cortex. And then if you follow it, once it appears, you'll see that there's a blue actin filament that fills in behind it. Also, we saw that these Foreman molecules, when they move in linear trajectories, they also move along pre-existing actin filaments. And we measured the intensity of the pre-existing actin filament before and after the foramen molecule went by it. And we saw that the intensity of the actin filament went up. So that means that as it's moving along a pre-existing actin filament, it's actually generating a new actin filament. And we quantified these events. And we found that in the imaging that we did, 80% of the linearly moving form and dots could be correlated with an actin filament. So that's pretty good. Most of those linearly moving dots are 
most likely making an actin filament. And then we measured their rates, and those rates are very similar to rates of actin polymerization in the cell cortex. And they did, don't differ between generating a new actin filament and moving along a pre-existing actin filament. And then you can see that there is an increase in actin fluorescence that's similar between generating a new actin filament and also generating one along a pre-existing actin filament. So we're very con um, confident that um, when we see a linearly moving trajectory of a formin molecule, it's making an actin filament right there in front of your eyes. So in summary, we know that these cl class II formin molecules are very, very important for cell polarity. We know that they localize to the cell cortex via the ability to bind to PI35P2. We know that they rapidly generate actin filaments. And so now the question is, what are they doing? What are they polarizing? Are they polarizing the vesicles? Are they polarizing other aspects of the membrane? And so um, we um, are looking at this very carefully. And we think that actin polymerization mediated by these class II formins may be promoting directional membrane, trans, uh, um, membrane uh, turnover. So these membrane, when it gets incorporated into the tip, it also has to be brought back into the cell. And we think that the formins are helping to make sure that that's happening right here at the tip. And so with that, I just want to thank the people in the lab who have helped with this. So this has been a very longstanding project in the lab, started by a very talented postdoc, Luis Vidali, who now has his own position um, and is continuing to work on myosins, and then followed by another postdoc, Ming Li, and a very talented graduate student, Peter. Um, thank you very much.